There's no debating that department stores have come under a lot of pressure, you know, as we've all seen it. Every single listener has changed the way they engage with retail. Epic started pushing its users to go directly to Epic, basically, to buy new games and circumventing that 30%. 30% app store tax, we call it for the sake of this episode. There's barely a business out there in the digital world that hasn't looked at the chokehold they have on the ecosystem. Hi there, and welcome to Stock Club, a podcast brought to you by My Wall Street. I'm Mike, and joining me today's episode is My Wall Street's chief investor, Emmett Savage. This podcast is brought to you by Vodafone Business. Now, if you're like us here in My Wall Street, you'll know that running a business is hard. There are countless things to think about, some get ignored and some get completely forgotten about. That's where Vodafone Business can help. They've crafted a suite of tools and supports to boost your business's operations and the best part is it's free for everyone. From cybersecurity to harnessing the power of AI, building a website and improving how your teams operate remotely, Vodafone Business will help you address the often overlooked but crucial elements for your business's success. To get started today, check out their Vodafone vHub digital support and advice service. You'll find everything you need right there. Find the link in our show notes or tr- just simply Google Vodafone VHub for more details. Now, let's dive into the show. Emmett, how are you? How are you getting on? Good to see you, Mike. I'm doing good. Are you recovered after our Christmas party? I am, I am, just about. How did you... So, how did you the Atlantic was, was pretty temperate at the end, wasn't it? It was lovely. It was just like the, the med. That's what I was going to say. The t- two big things. How did you get on with the swim and how did, what did you get for Secret Santa? So, um, the swim was, it was Baltic, like imagine, imagine melting a glacier, which unfortunately we don't need to imagine too hard to do, but, um, yeah, imagine melting a glacier and swimming in it. Well, that's what we endured last Thursday morning in Galway on Salt Hill Strand. Uh, so the problem with walking into the ocean is that it comprises of about 20 or 30 decisions. Like each footstep is a decision. (laughs) <laughs> and then you get there and you jump. Whereas if you just go to a pier and jump, it's only one decision. And that's why I would have rather go to the high board and jump into the sea. But we went to the agonizing one step at a time route. So I found it pretty tough. Um, as for Secret Santa, uh, oh, it was brilliant. I got a Michael D. Higgins, the president of Ireland, tea cozy. And I also got an incense burner, but it smells like Irish turf. <laughs> um, and, it, and you can burn it in a little cottage so uh lovely stuff what did you get uh, uh i got the basics i got a sock a pair of socks and a mug i don't think uh, i don't think my chris Crindle was getting too creative but i know he's listening so i feel like the socks are special uh, i'll say that much they are special what does the mug <laughs> say the mug says uh sound is a pound <laughs> <laughs> irish expression for what, Mike? How do you describe sound as a pound? Sound as a pound. What would sound as a pound be? Um, um, it just means like uh, some. Uh, it's good solid. Guy. Like, uh, yeah, someone is yeah. solid or a situation is solid. Sound as a pound. Sound as a pound. Right. That's for our American listeners. All right. Let's get into the show. So um, we have a big landmark case against Google that just yeah. kicked off this week. Yeah, I believe you're looking at it. So what was the story? A decision was found against Google, uh, where there was antitrust offenses and monopolistic behavior. And I was reading it only yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. Can you talk, about, talk us through the story, Mike? Yeah, so there's been a very public court case ongoing between Google and Epic Games. Epic Games is the maker of Fortnite and a litany of other popular mobile games, obviously, which people access through Google's Play Store, its App Store. So most people will know, but it's the basis of the lawsuit, so we may as well go over it. Basically, there's an app store tax. Google and Apple will take 30% of basically any any in-app purchase made or any purchase for an app made on their app stores, which is essentially, I don't know about you, but every app on my phone anyways. For subscriptions now, this drops to 15% in the second year. And then for smaller developers that take in under a million in revenue, they can also get applied that 15% instead of the 30%. But, you know, if you're a big company like Epic or Spotify or Match, Spotify and Match have also been through a similar rigmarole and they've, they've come out with different different outcomes, we'll say. But if you're one of those big companies, 
that's a huge tax on your revenue because the vast majority of your revenue is coming from that one source. Do you know what I mean? So no, oh, I know important. exactly what you mean, Mike. <laughs> For yeah. the first five years, my Wall Street was at the behest of the, the duopoly of Apple and Google, and it is a horrendous tax and it really hurts. Yeah, so the important distinction here um, is that it's only for digital services. So if you're listening to this and thinking like 30% of your Deliveroo or Uber orders go to Apple or Google, that's not the case. It's just kind of if you were to sign up for Tinder Plus, say. But it is, it's basically them gatekeeping the entire mobile ecosystem. That in fairness to them, they've built, you know, iOS mm-hmm. and Android are powering, are powering almost every phone in the world apart from a few kind of smaller operating systems. So there is the case that, all right, well, like, you know, we've built this system and you're using it. So we're able to charge you what we want. But for those companies that have enough power to kind of, we'll say, say go up against the big dogs, um, it's coming to a head now. And Epic is, Epic is kind of the harbinger of this new wave, we'll say. So what happened originally was Epic started pushing its users to go directly to Epic, basically, to buy new games and circumventing that 30%, 30% App Store tax, we call it for the sake of this episode. They mm. swiftly got kicked off both App Stores, and then they brought the antitrust case against both Apple and Google. And so in Google's case, it concluded this week, jurors found in favor for Epic on all counts Google was accused of anti-competitive behavior, quashing competition, overcharging its developers who had no choice but to use their service. And one of the key allegations was that Google illegally tied together its Play Store and its billing service, meaning developers are required to use both to have their apps included in the store. And this was the big one that kind of, well, it was all inclusive. It's, it's not one thing, but essentially it was just guilty of anti-competitive behavior, antitrust, mon- monopolistic behavior. So... That's kind of where we're standing now. Now, no no decision has been made in terms of remediation or anything, but but yeah, that's the lay of the land. And it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. It's a huge deal. I mean, there's barely a business out there in the digital world that hasn't looked at the chokehold they have on the ecosystem. And you're right, Apple and Google built that ecosystem and all credit to them. They've built the, the department store as it were, but the internet has existed for 20 years before that. And there was no kind of top skimming um, for any product sold over the internet. So I think digital businesses are now kind of comparing the way it was to the way it is. And certainly we and my Wall Street walked path and have lived that experience. So what happens next, Mike? I mean, how how is this gonna play out? So it seems to be now just frozen. The determination came out and the world is waiting to see, so what? Yeah, so the court's going to begin, it's not till January, I think, on what remedies to implement. But let's mm-hmm. let's kind of move away from that and maybe talk the long tail effects, which is that the entire mobile ecosystem could be kind of on its head if the decision is upheld. Mm-hmm. Of course, Google are going to be appealing. And in fairness to them, you know, they're not a monopoly. They're, they're a duopoly. Mm-hmm. So they might have something to fall back on there. I think according to its lawyers, it's saying that they compete intensely on price, quality, and security against Apple's App Store. And they do not want to lose 60 million Android users to Apple every year. It's Google has lowered its fee structure to compete with Apple, and it said this is not the behavior of a monopolist. Which, I mean, you know, fair enough. I don't know if that's... I'm not a legal expert. I don't know if that's enough grounds to say, all right, we're not a monopoly, but we are a, a duopoly, if you will. Um, yeah. will, that, will that be enough to get you away with it? So... Uh, yeah. It's interesting to see what happens next and we can kind of speculate here. And obviously look, this court case will go through years of appeals and million dollars legal fees and yada, yada. But what Epic have said, and this is an important line to draw here is that, and this is a quote here, Google's app store practices are illegal and they abuse their monopoly to extract exorbitant fees, stifle competition and reduce innovation. Mm. And what's now, in- it's interesting. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mike. No, no, I continue on there. I'm just going to say what's important is that that is what a jury of peers have said about Google. You know, that's not uh, going away anytime soon. And it's what I was going to say was, 
a duopoly and a monopoly, they're, they're first cousins. You know, there's a, a duopoly is Siamese twins, a monopoly with Siamese twins. And has Apple done anything? Have they, has there been any signal from Apple? How is it going to play out for them? Is there kind of a, a thought process out there on Apple's response? Or is it literally, are they just going to sit back and watch the show and glad it's not them? Well, a bit of both. So absolutely, to your second point, they are already doing that. But uh, Epic brought this similar lawsuit against Apple that ended in 2021. Oh. And yeah, for the most part, it, rules, it the judge ruled lar- largely in favor of Apple. So the difference there was there was no jury. And the decision was just left in the hands of one judge. So there was mm-hmm. com- some concessions and Apple is still fighting some changes to its rules from the judgment. The main one being that developers would be allowed to send customers to their own websites to basically circumnavigate the the Apple payment. But that's, I think there's a stay of execution on that. And that was kind of the main concession, which Apple are still fighting. So there's nothing as concrete as this whatsoever. So, but now the fact that maybe Apple made the right decision not bringing in a jury and maybe had some better lawyers than Google. But off the back of this decision, Epic wants to basically revive some key points from that case in the Supreme Court. And it's just mm. tough to see why they can't if they've set a precedent here with the Google ruling because they're basically mm. the same allegations on both companies. I don't see why there would be a distinction. Yeah, it reminds me of last week we spoke about Spotify and and as far as I recall a few years ago, well, actually, I definitely recall a few years ago, they're very much in locked horns with Apple who were in abuse of their monopolistic position. They didn't need to pay themselves a 30% cut whereas Spotify did. Am I right in saying so? Yeah. So actually, Spotify were brought up in the Google case as well because oh. Google has essentially made a special dispensation for Spotify where they can send people to Spotify.com or whatever else to pay. Oh, yeah. so there's a precedent set and a custom and practice, if you like, for bypassing the rule book if you fight hard enough. Yeah, pretty much. There's just, a, it will say, a special relationship between Google and Spotify because Spotify is such a, it's probably one of the largest revenue apps on the Play right. Store. You know what I mean? And that was yeah. actually a big part of Epic's case where I suppose it kind of shows that Google knew what they were doing wasn't completely right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, we'll make an exception for the big boys. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting if we want to start speculating about what, First of all, what the mobile ecosystem looks like after this, I think we're going to see a lot more power in developers' hands. We'll see, obviously, the main one is sending people directly to uh, directly to their own sites for payment and stuff. You know, mm. If you could pass mm. on that 30% discount to the customer, we're going to benefit from that, which Entirely. At, its, at its most basic case is you know, the benefits of not, not anti-competitive practices. Do you know what I mean? I think where anti-competitive mm. and like antitrust is gone is does it negatively affect the consumer and if apps can go and turn around and be like we're getting we're getting 25 percent off your subscription because we don't have to pay google 30 percent anymore that's a very clear mm. case of it when we talk about google we can speculate here even more um it gets a little spicier so it's not a huge huge part of Google's revenue source. Um, it, it came up in the court case. It made $12 billion in operating profit in 2021 with margins of more than 70%. According to Sundar Pichai, this is not accurate margins-wise, so it doesn't account for R&D costs for a- Android and all the rest. But what's really interesting is the timing of this. So as I mentioned, uh, what Epic said, you know, like as in basically Google has been found guilty of what is it now? Uh, illegal practices and abuses of their monopoly to extract exorbitant fees. So this is coming out while Google also has two more cases running against the Justice Department. The first one against its search engine dominance and the second against its advertising technology business. So the fact mm. that a San Francisco court is like kind of unequivocally said, yes, Google is guilty of anti-competitive behavior and monopolistic pricing doesn't look great right now and you know if you really want to get into it could this be the straw that breaks the camel's back and is this the is this the one court case that might lead to even google getting broken up i feel like i feel like that's a big statement to say but it's a lot more possible now than maybe 
mm. maybe last week. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's funny because we, we live with monopolies and we stop seeing them after a while, whether it's a utility provider or whether it is, of course, the search engine we just all use. And it brings me back to a conversation we had in a recent podcast about Porter's Five Forces. And it's only when one of those bargaining powers rises to a level that they can actually disrupt the system whether it's legally or through negotiation you actually see a monopoly start to fail like if you take it um slightly off topic but like the bargaining power of supplier i think of taylor swift that time at apple where uh, I think she just wasn't getting paid enough or did she threaten to pull her music? There was something about her rights on Apple Music and Spotify. Just she wasn't happy with the terms and conditions. And now we see an equivalent um, with Epic as they go, as they have now locked horns with Google and they are actually disrupting the rule book as it sits. Although I'm very curious to hear that that rule book has already had it. Uh, has already had an exception with this special relationship status. So I wonder, could it be resolved? Could Epic's um, case be resolved with a special relationship status or is the entire uh, rule book going to have to change? Well, this is interesting as well. And it kind of puts Epic in this freedom fighter status a bit where yeah. they weren't looking for compensation at all in their remediation process. They wanted google's app store to be open and more competitive which is completely wow. vague but the intention is look we're not going to we're not trying to we're not trying to profit off this we're not trying to get a better relationship for ourselves this is to actually mm. bring in change within the mobile ecosystem and so for that reason i think we will see much more long-term impacts than just epic getting paid out whatever 500 million quid or something yeah, so yeah, yeah. It, it leaves Google in a very tenuous position. Just out of curiosity, if Google was broken up, where would you like, uh, what what company would you invest in? Or would you invest in all of them? Would you invest in the search business, the ad tech business, the cloud business? Flip in, uh, what's it called? The, yeah. uh, the, the driverless taxis, Waymo. Yeah, um, I based on the four choices there and without knowing the economics of any of them, um, I'd lean towards the cloud business um, because I think the ad tech business is, I mean, they have the lead position, but I believe ad tech is getting uh, smarter and smarter and disruptors are coming up and actually changing the dynamics of that particular market, even though Google hold the keys with the algorithm search business. I mean, the search business and the ad business, that's the same thing, isn't it? The like to make a distinction isn't probably isn't fair, but more so the, the ad exchanges and the auctions, which are yeah. so linked to the search business that that is why I think they're getting, um, they're getting another yeah. anti-competitive, uh, antitrust case against them. But yeah, if you could invest in Google ventures, which is their their bottom drawer of their kitchen, which is a yeah, bit of that's everything. The, I'm, the moonshot. Yeah. yeah. The moonshot. I'm very I'm very interested in that because they're out to cure things like senescence, which is like the process. It's a disease, but it really is just as we all know, getting old. So yeah. when you look at somebody who's 80, you can tell they're 80 because of senescence. It's a uh, I suppose a, a, a what would you say it's a it, it, it's a convergence of illnesses that altogether you just say, oh, they died of old age. They and they're of old age cure, yeah. yeah, they're there to cure senescence. So they're thinking very big. I read an article once in, um, it was either Fortune or, or Forbes, that if you walked in to Sergei Brin with a, a time machine um, and you said, right, I'll plug this in, I've invented a time machine, he'd be annoyed that you need to plug it in. So good <laughs> isn't good enough. Great isn't great enough. Like he's the type of person who strives for more. More is not enough. So I kind of like the incubation yeah. of, well, it's almost reflected in my, that's also invested in my investment style. I like businesses that are earlier on in their journey with a big disruptive mission. Uh, so that's probably whatever aligns with that is what I would invest in uh, should that should that breakup ever happen what about you which of the let's say four or five piles of business would you have most interest in i think i like the cloud business because it's probably the only one not guilty of an, a monopoly at the minute because yeah. i think yeah. it's behind amazon True. and microsoft um the 
the moonshot portfolio actually makes a lot less sense by itself because it's mm-hmm. basically using excess profits to fund it uh, from Google's other ventures. I mm-hmm. think, and maybe this isn't making a distinction because Waymo was originally a moonshot. I'm not sure if it still is, but I think Waymo could be really interesting. I think mm-hmm. there's there's a lot of progress being made there very fast. No doubt. Yeah, well, driverless, as we discussed in recent times, is is inevitable. It's just, I think, arriving a little slower than one might think. But yes, I think Waymo, they, the open source brand that uh, Google brings, I think is ultimately going to be the Android of, of driverless cars is going to be Waymo, I think we can say. I'm going to do a quick promo first. first. Um, so a quick reminder, folks, from Vodafone Business, sponsors of Stock Club, check out their free one-to-one digital support and advice today to discuss a range of topics from social media tips, cybersecurity, and building a website for your business. Search Vodafone VHub or click on the link in the show notes. Uh, Right, Emmett, Macy's. So I remember this from, geez, I don't know how long ago it was now, three years ago, I'd say, where you said on this podcast that you thought Macy's was, uh, it was in less than $5 a share. You thought it was in the bargain basement and you thought it was going to double in the year ahead. Was that your call? That was the call. Yeah, and uh, so it's back in the news after an announcement on Monday that an investor group consisting of Arc House Management and Brigade Capital has made a $5.8 billion offer to take the department chain store private. Shares are up about 20% on the news. So talk to me about everyone's favorite visit to when they're in New York. <laughs> right, well, for a start, Macy's operates under three brands, Macy's, Bloomingdale's and Blue Mercury, which I'm not familiar with. I think it might be a makeup brand. But anyway, that's the three big brands that they have. And together they have 780 stores, um, I think entirely in the United States and of course online. But interestingly, the company goes back to 1858 when Roland Hussey Macy opened a small dry goods store. That's a great old fashioned name there. Great grandpapa Roland Hussey. I love that name. It's like, you know, you don't mess with a Roland Hussey Macy. Like that's a it's absolute 10 out of 10 for a name. But what's interesting is that about 12 years after he opened the first store, great grandpappy Roland introduced a concept of fixed prices, which eliminated haggling and provided customers, of course, with transparency. And then a few years later, Macy's pioneered the use of window displays to capture attention and showcase all the lovely things that they have for sale. Um, and they're two giant retail innovations that we don't see or even regard, regard anymore because they're the norm. You go in, there's a fixed price and there's a window that you saw the item that you, you want to buy. But you can imagine going into Macy's now and haggling for a bottle of eau de cologne. Uh, I'll give you 10 turnips for that. <laughs> no, 12 turnips are nothing. Bring 11 back. turnips. Arshing. <laughs> okay, 11 and a half turnips. You're an awful man. The boss will die. Go on. 11 and a half turnips. Here's your perfume. I'll put the turnips in the cash register. Mark, <laughs> uh, Mike, apart from the, <laughs> I'm calling you Mark, Mike, apart from the retail brands and the network and all that retail stuff that goes uh, with owning a chain of department stores, do you know what else you're buying when you purchase Macy's? No, real estate. Uh, yeah, I'll get on to that. But you're, bu- you're buying the Thanksgiving Day Parade, which is oh, a tradition yeah, 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 yeah. since 1924. Like, did you ever see that when you lived in New York, the, the Thanksgiving Parade? I never went to it, no. Uh, well, it's 100 years old next year, Mike, so we should over- head over to see it. I think I heard the real Spider-Man is going to be there, so we should definitely <laughs> head over. Well, what as you said, um, what are they buying? And I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, their shares surged on Monday after Arc House Management and Brigade Capital submitted a buyout proposal, uh, which is 21 bucks a share. It's pretty much there now. So if that was a 32% premium on where the show, shares closed the day before. And as Arc House um, is a specialist acquisition firm. They look at real estate investments and they've bid in the past for office space developer, uh, Columbia Property Trust and preferred apartment communities, which manage multifamily housing and Brigade Capital Management, on the other hand, which is the other half of the, the bidder, they're more retail focused and they have investments that have included JC Penney's and Sears and Nyman Marcus and and lots of other brands. So this is potentially a perfect acquisition partnership, Um, but they are almost certainly interested in Macy's for its real estate. And of course, Macy's has declined to comment. And as of January, Macy's owned 
more than 300 of its 780, 783 stores, which, as I said, includes Bloomingdale's and this Blue Mercury beauty chain. And it owns an additional 102 locations, but leases the land that the stores sit on. So that's the kind of backdrop of what's actually happening. Okay, interesting. So if they're looking at the real estate rather than the stores, could this be the beginning of the end for for Mm -hmm. Macy's? Hi, folks. Just cutting in here to give a shout out to our friends at Babbel. Did you know that learning a new language affects areas of the brain unrelated to language processing, such as visual spatial span? With Babbel, you're not only acquiring a new language, but you're also expanding your cognitive universe. This fall, start speaking a new language in just three weeks with Babbel. Instead of paying hundreds of dollars for a private tutor or fooling yourself with language apps that are little more than games, Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are designed by over 150 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. It's designed by real people for real conversations, and all of its tips and tools for learning a new language are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversational-based teaching. I personally use Babbel to brush up on my French, and I can survive now in bars and restaurants, which is all I've been doing, but not a bad, not a bad problem to have. And who knows, if I keep this up, maybe in this time next month, I'll be doing this whole ad read in French. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. Uh, studies from Yale, Michigan University, and others continue to prove that Babbel is better. For instance, one study found that using Babbel for 15 hour- hours is equivalent to a full semester of college. Depends what you did in college, I think. But you know the, you know the gist. With over 10 million subscriptions sold, Babbel is real language learning for real conversation. So... With that in mind, here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. To get you started right now, you can get 55% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash stock club. 55% off at babbel.com slash stock club. So Babbel is spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash stock club. Rules and restrictions may apply. Back to the show. There's no debating that department stores have come under a lot of pressure, you know, as we've all seen it. Every single listener has changed the way they engage with retail over the last four years. Um, whether it's the fact that we've moved to online or discount stores or fast fashion retailers, or we're buying directly from brands. So if you like Allbirds, you don't go to Macy's to buy them, you go to allbirds.com. Um And so this has really disrupted the retail and especially the department store experience. Like Coles is is an example of a publicly uh, traded department store chain, bit of a tongue twister, a publicly traded department store chain, which has faced pressure from activist investors and continues to struggle with really poor sales. Uh, JC Penney has filed, filed for bankruptcy and, and was rescued by mall owners. Saks of Fifth Avenue, uh, Neiman Marcus have been looking at mergers uh, because there's been a huge slump. Um, and apparently there's a chain called Bon Ton, which is, again, just seems to be withering in the sun. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, only Diller, Dillard's, which is run by its founding family has continued to thrive. So there is an existential threat for all department stores and Macy's is not immune to it. What's interesting, I suppose, is it did fend off pressure from activists in the past who were keen for the chain to sell its real estate and then lease it back. And these moves generate profits for investors up front, but they really do saddle a business with uh, debt like rent payments that reduce oh, its ability 100%. to that. Yeah. Imagine someone coming into your business and being like, we want to turn all your assets into liabilities. Oh, look. And when I hear of it, Mike, I think of things like mobile mobile operators who sell their tower networks to companies. Um, for example, American Tower, the giant REITs, and in doing so, get a check up front. But in essence, divest a very important and strategic asset that is just not easy to build. A mobile phone network, just like a department store network, is a really difficult thing. The planning laws, the building, the maintenance, the management. And I can see the frontal lobe thinking for a a company going, well, look, just get rid of this. It's a non-core asset. It's not what we do. We run the department stores. Or indeed, if you're mobile operators, we we wire up routers and gooters and we build people, but we don't run big metal towers. But um, in essence, uh, I don't, I I personally don't like it. Um, So where are we? Well, Mervyn's, for example, is a, is a defunct department store chain and it it offers a real cautionary tale about this kind of sale and leaseback approach um 
private equity firms moved in and they bought Mervyn's and split it into an operating co and then this property company. And then the property company raised its rents just as the economy flipped over into a recession and Mervyn's went bust as a result of that strategic decision. And then, as I mentioned, Sears, like Sears went bankrupt in 2018 after its owner, uh, which was the head fund manager, Eddie Lampart, sold off its real estate over a period of years and didn't reinvest enough of the proceeds into retail operations. And today, Sears is just a, what once was an American icon is just a shadow of its former self. It's a handful of stores, which it had thousands and thousands of stores in its heyday. And when I lived in Maine in 1988, it was Sears everywhere. Uh, but anyway, up until now, Macy's has only opted to sell some locations, such as a store in San Francisco, and then it has a, a team and real estate firms to kind of look and value the rest of their assets. But here's an interesting fast fact, or fast something, I don't know if it's a fact. Again, according to that Wall Street Journal piece, Macy's flagship New York store in Herald Square accounts for about a fifth of the value of its real estate portfolio. Um, so really, when you go to America, New York, I, I mean, and most Irish tourists in New York City end up heading into Macy's, it's an amazing event. Like, it's a huge thing. And every morning, they clap you as you arrive, if you're an early riser. And it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a great thing. That piece of real estate, you can just imagine its value sitting in the bullseye of Manhattan Island. And, on, on the, uh, you know, like, Macy's is an American icon. It is a, one of these brands that just is as America as American as apple pie. And I'd, be, I'd prefer if they were just left alone. And as they say over here, leave good enough alone and just let this new incoming CEO who's starting in January or February to give it a shot, continue to improve operations without selling the golden goose. Like they, they re make has really improved its overall position in the market over the last couple of years, its its share price, as I as you said in the opener, went from something like four bucks and change a few years ago to about thirty bucks at a high, and now now someone is moving in to buy it at twenty dollars and change, and I, I I would prefer to see it left alone because the the history books show that this type of acquisition does not work out in the long term if your interest is keeping a department store. A department chain store open yeah i think these kind of funds though are only interested in the bottom line aren't they it's just it, it's it's a classic asset play really and it's really interesting to yeah. think of those legacy businesses that would have built up this real estate portfolio not unintentionally but like almost just as part of their normal operations but over the course of how long has macy's been around 100 years you mm -hmm. said 99 over the course of that 99 years they've amassed what has become this unbelievable real estate portfolio across yeah. America. And yeah. what you said, like one of the most valuable buildings in New York is part of it. Yeah. It's, it. It's an interesting way of looking at stocks. And I remember Peter Lynch, it was one of his, it was one of his six types of stocks. And he mentioned that in particular, he had an example, I think it was some ranch in Texas that the real mm. estate, the land was on was worth twice as much as the stock price. So, it yeah. is interesting, and I, it, that's probably where these types of investors look is for those legacy businesses, mm. well, especially when it mm. comes to real estate that have built up almost unbeknownst to them a, a, a yeah. real estate portfolio like that. So yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I wonder. But I'd before love to we move off, about, I, sorry, Mike. No, no, it's just the same. I'd love to know about McDonald's, uh, McDonald's oh, global yeah. footprint when it comes to real estate. I think it'd be a really interesting study. All right. Are they freeholders or leaseholders? Do they actually buy the turf of land? I think they've, they must have a mixed approach. They couldn't roll out the way they, they do if they didn't have a bit of both. I think originally it was they bought the land and then would rent it back to the uh, rent it back to the manager of that store was, was how it worked. Ah, uh, Oh, interesting. But never have I heard of anyone selling their house, for example, and then renting it off the buyer. And that's bringing it right back to a domestic situation. Maybe it happens, and I can see why you would do it um, if you felt like uh, I'm in my 70s, I've only so many years left on this planet and I want to unlock some capital. But when you take the fact that people don't do it with what is generally their primary asset and then transpose that feeling or thought onto a commercial property or a chain of department stores the same logic applies you know the asset is the asset selling it for cash a check up front sure that's fine 
but there you go. I just don't think it's a good thing to do. But then again, maybe if I was sitting in one of those capital acquisition firms, I'd have a different opinion. Yeah, I think maybe your your analogy was unintentionally very, very accurate where someone is in their later ages and just wants a bit of cash to enjoy before they kick the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> Could be yeah, the same thing for Macy's. Yeah, yes, exactly. Oh, haunting. Anyway, look, on the, on the subject of of Christmas, because Macy's to me is just a total seasonal business. Like I, I, when I think of Macy's, I think of Christmas. I thought it'd be fun for the two of us to uh, do a seasonal pitch. You know, at the time of year, we're at middle December, we've two weeks left in the year, um, there's Christmas trees and lights up everywhere. So I'm going to hit you, Mike, for a seasonal pitch. It can be whimsical or absolutely factual, like the one I'm going to hit you with. So go ahead. Yeah, um, and the obvious one to go for is anything e-commerce. So you can go Amazon, Shopify, Etsy, even globally for a less obvious name in this space. But I thought we'll stay with e-commerce, but we'll go a bit Hold further. on a minute. Global E as a, C, as a Christmas E stock. You're nearly as bad as me. Anyway, go on to yeah. <laughs> keep going. Oh, it's going to get a lot more boring, Emma. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so... I was like, I just said, no, in fairness, I might have been a bit rushed. So I didn't, I didn't have a time to go around Google and stuff, but I just said e-commerce, yeah. what's a good e-commerce yeah. stuff basically. Okay. Uh, so we're going e-commerce, but we're avoiding the tech companies and actually going for a REIT. And that REIT is Prologus or Prologus. Oh. Uh, so for the uninitiated, a REIT stands for a real estate investment trust and gives smaller investors access to real estate, basically. You can buy it through stock exchanges instead of going through the rigmarole of actually buying up real estate yourself. You can buy a very small portion of it. So they operate yeah. portfolios of income generating real estate, and they basically operate as normal businesses, except for a few exceptions. The most important one for us investors is that they have to give 90% of their taxable income back to investors in the form of dividends. So... Prologus is one of the largest REITs in the world with nearly 5,000 buildings in about 20 countries. It operates warehousing space for companies like Amazon, FedEx, UPS, and Walmart. So it's a huge logistics operation, essentially. So vital cog in the global supply chain continues to deliver growth. And as more and more business operate as either digital first or solely digital and online, a company like Prologus is only becoming more and more relevant, uh, so as you said, really strong dividend yield, nearly 3%. Great CEO. He's got about 40 years of experience in industrial real estate. Uh, his name is Hamid Mohadam, which isn't a great pronunciation, I assume. Um, he also has a pretty significant stake in the business himself. So yeah, there's a lot to like there. Um, only risk, well, there's obviously plenty of risks, but one of the big risks you can immediately recognize is that it's a very close relationship with Amazon, who is at the minute, like is always building out its logistics and fulfillment network. So would Amazon look to kind of bring those costs internal um, eventually? That would be the only concern I'd have. But yeah, really strong business and and interesting, especially if you don't know REITs. It's a, a good place to start there. So Santa Claus could keep his sleigh in a prologus warehouse and that's why it's a Christmas Eve stock. Pick. Well, like, I think there's an argument to be made that a prologus warehouse could be Santa's workshop. Oh, the modern, the modern day Santa's workshop. I wonder if you, if you have a business like selling logs or something and you have a prologus warehouse, is it a badge of honor? It's like, come on, mama, come show. I'm going to show you my new business. I'm selling logs and there uh, you go, ma'am, it's a... It's a prologus warehouse. It's just like, oh, son, very yeah. proud of you. Thanks it is family. actually interesting um, if you look at where you get your deliveries from. There might be a, yeah. there's a high chance of a prologus sticker. So yeah, Ready? come on, you're you're pulling my leg. Are you said? Have you ever seen a prologus sticker on anything? Oh yeah, all the time. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of Amazon deliveries. Uh, a lot of the big shops, you'll see a prologus sticker when you get your deliveries in. And that's why it's Christmas. You nailed it, Mike. That was absolutely magnificent. Well, I, I, I'm going to go with one in a similar vein. Um, and it's an American icon, a little bit better known than Prologus. And it's FedEx. The two of us were so dry. Jesus, this episode, very... honestly, we're going, to have to, we're going to have to put Christmas music in the background of this episode. Yeah. Mike, honestly, um, I just don't know how we're going to kind of jazz it up a bit. Yeah, I want FedEx. Everyone knows what it is. $68 billion. Uh, 
you know, they deliver footballs at Christmas in planes that crash, Wilson. Um, but basically, it's just an American icon, and it is busier in Q4 every year. And it is such an efficient business. It's one of those stocks that you don't think about much. It has... Um, an amazing dividend, 1.8%. It has its its share price has just been on a multi year tear. I mean, it floated around, I think, around January '85, and since then it's just been it's just grown and grown and grown. And it it, it kind of went out of a trap way back in the '80s at nine dollars a share. It's now now by two hundred seventy dollars a share. But it's not like the game is over. This business continues to deliver stuff it continues more or less to grow revenue revenue is is a slow upward it goes up a bit down a bit up a bit up down a bit it's very capitally a capital efficient with return on equity and i just think it's a great business i mean what says christmas more than fedex um you know i, I was going to pitch coca-cola because i don't is there any truth in the rumor that coke invented the modern day image of santa claus or is that just a load of baloney an urban myth I just have no clue. <laughs> what from that yeah, ad, the truck ad? I well, yeah, that's the modern incarnation. But I believe, like they, they it was Coca Cola who fashioned the white beard, red suit that uh, Santa is known for. But either way, uh, that's not my pitch. It's not Coca Cola. I'm going with FedEx. <laughs> everybody's favorite Christmas stock. All right, that's two of the most boring Christmas elevator pitches you've ever ah, heard. Ah, here. But, uh, between well, interrupting and you, and uh, I'm interrupting you, and the pictures were. Bo- I honestly, Mike, I swear to God, you know what we're going to have to do just send everybody something nice when they listen to this podcast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, before we finish up, just a quick thank you for our friends of Vodafone Business. Uh, if you're a business owner in need of a leg up when it comes to your digital transformation, get yourself over to Vodafone V Hub to book your appointment today. You can find the link in our show notes for more details. Right, Evert, thank you very much for joining me on today's show and thank you everyone for listening. Remember, if you have any questions you like answered or elevator pitches you like us to tackle, maybe more interesting than the ones we just gave you, uh, make sure to get in touch. You can find us on Twitter at my Wall Street HQ, on TikTok at my Wall Street, or simply just email us at pod at mywallstreet.com. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a review and tell your friends all about us. Thanks for joining and we'll talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.